Thank you, DJ Giovanni. That was amazing. I notice I still have my backdrop from my last meeting where we thank Jack for his last day in our SLT meetings. Um, hi, I'm Paul Darcy and I lead marketing for Indeed. And as the executive sponsor of Indeed's Black Inclusion Group, otherwise known as BIG, I am glad to welcome you to today's event on progressing in a downturn. The timing of this big sponsored event is important. With COVID-19, this moment right now is the crisis of a generation. And the data is clear that COVID is not an equal opportunity virus. In the UK, black and minority ethnic people face an increased risk of exposure to COVID. And reasons for this include occupation, a high proportion of black people are key workers and therefore are more likely to be in harm's way during this crisis. And this risk is partly why black men and women are nearly twice as likely to die from coronavirus than white men and women. And that's even after taking into account age and socio-demographic factors. And when it comes to economic downturns, we know from the 2008 financial crisis that black people in the UK and the US fared worse than the white majority. In the UK, black unemployment peaked at almost 15% in 2009, way higher than the national average. And during the recession, black and ethnic minority people were nearly twice as likely as white groups to have no savings at all. So before we start, I need to share a content warning. The discussions today will contain reference to racism and could be triggering for many of us please also remember that this webinar is being recorded. So it's in this context, I'm pleased to turn it over to Lillian, our London Big Site Lead. Thank you, Lillian. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. My name is Lillian Oka, and I'm the Black Inclusion Group Lead for London. I've been at Indeed just a little over two years now, and I not only get to help people get jobs through my marketing role, but by being part of the Black Inclusion Group, I get to shed light on important topics, such as the one we'll be discussing tonight. Um, we started the Black Inclusion Team in London not too long ago for various reasons, but at its core, those reasons were to foster growth and support of the Black community within Indeed, as well as to inspire those externally on just how inclusive our company culture is. As Paul mentioned, we saw a need to hold this event tonight because A, the Black community is disproportionately affected by COVID-19 due to socio and economic factors. And B, if we have a platform to be able to have open and honest conversations with some incredible, inspiring speakers, such as the ones you'll be listening to tonight, then why not use that platform to hold employers, allies, as well as job seekers accountable? Tonight, we look to highlight why inclusion and belonging matter more now, than, more now than ever. We'll identify ways you can interrogate company culture and work where you can truly be yourself. We'll hear from an amazing guest speaker, Humble Benny, on ways you can prepare yourself financially for the weeks and months ahead. And lastly, there'll be a Q&A, so feel free to ask as many questions as you would like using the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So, Let's begin. I want to start by introducing you all to some incredible speakers and industry changers that are going to be on this event tonight. So firstly, Carmen Bryant, an international speaker and strategic marketing leader who motivates action by translating insights and cultural shifts into compelling stories. She's a marketing insights and thought leadership expert with more than 20 years of experience and we are blessed to have her here at Indeed. Secondly, Ken Okarafo is the founder of Humble Penny and Financial Joy Academy platforms with the core mission of helping at least 10,000 families within this decade achieve um, financial freedom. He started his financial journey um, and gained his financial independence at the age of 34. And he is a first generation immigrant who came here at the age of 14. His work has been featured across many different platforms, such as the BBC, The Guardian, just to name a few, just to name a few. So he's a pretty big deal, and we're very thankful to have him on this event tonight. And lastly, LaFawn Davis, who is Vice President of Diversity and Belonging here at Indeed. She leads Indeed's strategic efforts to remove bias and eliminate barriers to entry by focusing on 
inclusive features and accessibility in products to help all people get jobs and create, and create a diverse and inclusive work environment for Indeed's employees. Having spent more than 15 years serving DNI leadership roles at innovative global companies such as Yahoo and Google, just to name a few, Lafon is an inspiring woman charging the way for diversity, inclusion, and belonging here at Indeed and beyond. A woman that I'm proud to be able to work beside and learn from. So here is Lafon Davis. Thank you so much, Lillian. That was a great introduction. I'm really excited about this event and full disclosure. I am still dancing to the DJ in my chair. So if you see me swaying a little bit, that's why. Um, these are these are extraordinary and anxious times for people. And, and that's why I'm actually so glad that we opened up with the DJ and a little bit of music because as my Indians often hear me say, joy is an act of resistance. So I'm really glad that we actually started off with some joy today. But just a few weeks ago, I think most people's main concern was the coronavirus, was COVID-19 and how it might affect their health, their, their family's health, their friend's health, um, as well as what was gonna happen in the job market. Since then, uh, the death of George Floyd and many, many other black lives has sparked a wave of unrest, debate, and introspection. Black people are on the front line of both, which is why conversations like these are really important. While we wanna empower job seekers with knowledge, and ideas to help them during these difficult times, employers also have a major role to play in creating a better workplace where people can feel like they can be their true selves and where they can thrive. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, later in this session. But for now, I wanna bring up my amazing panelists, Carmen and Ken, if you could join me, please. Hello. Fantastic. Thank you both for being here with me today and having this uh, amazing and I think necessary conversation. Um, as Lillian mentioned, there's going to be, uh, we're going to use the Q&A function within Zoom. So get your questions ready and you can start posting them anytime. Uh, to get us started, I actually believe storytelling is one of the greatest actions we can take towards change. Uh, it helps people kind of understand at a more deeper and intimate level uh, someone's story. So Carmen, let's start with you. Can you walk us through your story leading up to Indeed, what you do for Indeed now, and, and what have been the highlights of your career? Sure. Um, so I'm going to start at the beginning. So I was uh, born in Memphis, Tennessee, but I was raised in Mississippi in a pretty, um, a fairly white community. So I, I grew up in a very racialized environment. And I think very early on, I learned um, how to leverage charm and personality to my advantage. Um, it has been something that I've, you know, probably leaned into quite a bit. Um, I don't want to imply that I wasn't substantive as well. I did uh, go to Harvard. I left Mississippi and went to Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that was a pretty hefty culture shock. Um, but it also really enabled me to be able to adapt to a variety of situations. Um, I majored in African American studies and sociology, so I've always been very interested. I think as a, as a person of color, you have your lived experience, but then there's really the, the process of starting to understand and make um, sort of sense of the world around you. And so college was a big part of that um, experience for me. Um, I moved to New York shortly thereafter. Um, and have you know worked for consulting companies? I've worked in consumer, you know, products, but spent the bulk of my career in media. Um, and I worked at Essence for six years. I worked at NBC Universal for about three and a half years. And I think a big part of what I did there was really looking at research and insights and thinking about how we applied that to creative endeavor. So I would you know talk to our you know, readers, I would talk to organizations and really use that to inform how we created stories or uh, put together covers for Essence. Um, at NBC, a large part of it was thinking about 
how do we have some kind of informed way to come up with creative ideas and solutions? So creating, you know, custom branded content. So I very much live in the intersection of kind of art and science, you know, thinking about the information and the data and the numbers, but then also thinking about how do we create stories around that. And I think stories have been a big part of how I've connected with people, uh, typically through, through work and sharing the, the stories of, of folks around us. Uh, but also I think more and more my own story. Um, highlight, I've, I've had a lot of great highlights that indeed I have to say it was um, uh, a company that I was less familiar with when I first started other than as you know a place to go get a job but I didn't know anyone that worked at Indeed. So I am someone that posted on the platform, got an interview and got a job. Um, so I think it's important that we all recognize that it's, you know, really important that we have those kinds of, you know, it's, it can't always just be networking. Um, and, you know, while at Indeed, I've had an opportunity to, you know, co mc our global conference uh, that's in front of 2000 people every year. That was a really big highlight. Um, I think, you know, when I was younger, I thought when I would travel internationally, that was going to be a really big indication that I had made it, you know, and so I think and indeed having an opportunity to uh, really go and meet our job seekers and our partners where they are and where they live and understand what their issues and priorities are has been uh, very fulfilling both professionally and, and personally. Um, when I was at Essence, you know, we also did some amazing things in terms of, you know, the music festival and, you know, we did a lot of research around black women and technology and finance and really trying to change the, the conversation around black women, um, you know, just out in the, in the world. So um, those, that's, that's the, the shortest version of my story <laughs> that I can give and a little bit of the, of the highlights of, of you know, my career. Um, at Indeed, I'm the director of marketing for the US. So that means I focus on our go to market strategy specifically with enterprise customers. And what that really means is that I'm very much aligned with our sales organization and trying to help our largest companies leverage Indeed um, to the fullest. So that is sharing insights, that is making sure that they are aware of us and understand us and getting the best out of us that we're uh, educating them about job seekers and making sure that they have uh, the right plans, tools, conversations in place to be able to meet job seekers um, where they are and bring them on. So it's uh, never dull. It's been a really interesting four years. Um, I started a little over um, in February 2016. Um, and it's been, uh, you know, quite a quite an interesting journey. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Carmen. Uh, Ken, um, I'd love for you to share your story as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and what led you to where you are today? Thank you. So, hi everybody. Just want to say I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so I'd love to talk to you about my life and I, I like to look at it in three different blocks. So I'm 36 years old and the first 14 years of my life, I was born in a remote village in southeastern Nigeria. Uh, that's West Africa for those who are trying to understand where that is. And I grew up there and then lived a very nomadic life with my family. So we moved around Nigeria a lot and I lived predominantly in Lagos where I spent a lot of my time playing street football and hanging around with other people, doing things, doing creative things. At the age of 14, my, my mum and my sisters, my siblings, decided to take off and join my dad, who had immigrated to the UK already, to the United Kingdom already, uh, and joined him here after living without my dad for about six years. So I moved to the UK at the age of 14 to a completely different world. For the first time, I saw a white man, a white woman. I saw trains for the first time. A completely radically different world. One that challenged me in many ways culturally and challenged my perception of what the world was really about. I faced all kinds of challenges, which brings me to the second part of my life. So the first 14 years was lived in Nigeria. The second half I call my decade of survival, where essentially we moved to the UK and shockingly we didn't have you know, the various rights you need to live here and do things. So if 
for that first that decade, we had essentially no rights to work, no rights to the health service, no rights to essentially do life how the average individual might do it. So what that meant was for us in that decade, we spent most of it on the ground. So we were essentially learning how to make money, how to survive, how to thrive in a country where you essentially have no rights, but you're also learning the culture, the language, you're going through schooling for the first time with people you've never ever met in your life before. And that decade was actually instrumental in what would become the next decade, what I call my decade of thriving. Because in that decade of survival, essentially, when you can't solve a problem in one way, if you really must survive, you find a way of solving the problems in another way. So where we couldn't get jobs, we learned how to create companies because opening and starting a company was a lot easier than going to a job center and trying to find a job. So we created all kinds of businesses from uh, salons, we started a magazine business, we started an events business, we started children's nurseries. In fact, we still own some of those nurseries today. But in that decade of survival, right at the end of it, around 2008, which is when that decade ended for me personally, 2009 became the year that I met my wife and I began what became my decade of thriving because all the things I've been learning, going to school and all the things that have been happening before that, going through school, getting a first class degree, kind of just growing in my education because I got bullied a lot at school for you know, how I looked, how I spoke at the time. I focused a great deal on basically schooling and schooling became the vehicle that I needed to kind of get myself out of where I was. So I went to university, I studied economics and accountancy, managed to get in, focused for, for three years, did exceptionally well, top of the year in my, my, in my, my cohort, finished that and went off to train as a chartered accountant, finished that, went on to start my career uh, in finance, in financial services, industry here in the UK, in asset management pr predominantly. And my career just rocketed from there. I became a management accountant, became uh, a head of finance, became financial controller, became UK finance director for a NAS NASDAQ listed company and became chief financial officer um, a few years after that. So I rose pretty rapidly, but parallel to that in this decade of thriving, I was building my life with my wife and we'd set off on a journey, which is a journey that has radically changed our lives. We began optimizing our lives for financial independence. We'd come across each other at a property investing seminar that I went to and I met my wife and we became good friends. Her name's Mary. And from there we set off to uh, get married, start a family and began to design what in fact became the life that we wanted. We wanted to live a radically different life to our parents who spent all their time working every minute of the day to provide for us as a family, to uh, pay for rent and to pay for the things that you need to when you are an immigrant to a country and trying to find your way. So today, uh, actually two months ago, I quit my job uh, as a chief financial officer in, in venture capital where I've been working in the creative industries. And I set off just to focus on running my own business. And the reason we've been able to do that is because after 10 years of planning, of redesigning our lives, of investing and outsourcing money making to assets, my wife and I were in a position whereby we had basically created a life that's radically different to our parents. And we have the optionality to pursue our dreams, to live our passions, one of which is why I'm on this platform today, to talk to you guys about finances, because I launched a blog in 2017 uh, for, you know, to, to start to talk about money in a radically different way, in a way that you can hear a voice from someone like me, who looks like me, who's been through my life experiences, but who's able to articulate them in a simple way that the ordinary man or woman on the street can understand, and most importantly, take action to start to change their financial lives. So this is why I'm here today. Uh, today I run the Humble Penny and Financial Joy Academy with my wife, and we have a huge mission of trying to empower 10,000 families this decade and help them change their lives and work towards achieving their life of financial independence as well. Ken, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, finances and you're, you're a financial independence expert. Yep. Uh, what is financial independence? Why yep. is it important to you? you? You gave us a little bit of glimpse into that, into your story. Um, and especially why should it be important for those in the black community? Okay. 
It's a pretty powerful question. So first of all, financial independence by definition is a stage on the money journey. So everybody who's watching this presentation today is on a money journey, although most people don't realize that they are. So the money journey spans from people who live paycheck to paycheck, perhaps, all the way to people who experience financial abundance in their lives, such as your, your big billionaires and people, perhaps. Okay? Financial independence is a stage on the money journey where the income from your assets essentially exceed your monthly living expenses. If you've got some assets that generate you income that far exceed your monthly living expenses, then you are considered to be financially independent. Now, why is this important to me? Well, it's critically important to me because it has helped to create optionality in my life, something that I never ever thought was a possibility. Like last year, for example, we became mortgage free and this house we live in is completely mortgage free, something that my parents, even when my dad retired at the age of 67, they hadn't even paid, paid their mortgage off. So for me personally, it gave us the option to choose the life that we wanted. And for me, that life was enjoying a life with my wife and children and pursuing my passions. Now, specifically for the black community, why does this matter? Okay. The key word I use in my introduction for what financial independence is, is the word assets. What you find is that a lot of black people, particularly in the UK, speaking from a UK perspective, a lot of black people do not have assets to their names. Okay. And assets are necessary for you to start to build wealth over time and for you to develop the mindset that's necessary for wealth because it's that mindset that then leads to you uh, designing a life that works for you by outsourcing money making to those assets to work for you 24 seven when you're not working eight hours a day, for example. So assets is a key reason. Uh, the second reason why it's really important to the black community is because of the racial debt gap. So a lot of you might be aware or might not be aware that there is a racial debt gap. When you look at the net worth of a typical white family, and look at the net worth of a typical black family, what you'll notice is that a typical black family will have all kinds of debt because a lot of the families are typically relying on debt to finance their lifestyles. Whereas, and there's, there are reasons for that, for that, by the way, systematic as well as um, generational reasons. Whereas the white families, for example, uh, perhaps have a step ahead. They might have inherited money, and things like that. So financial independence essentially plays a critical role in trying to empower these families uh, to get to a point where they might even be able to create generational wealth for their families. Well, sorry, I was just clapping and snapping over here. <laughs> um, I have to say congratulations on being mortgage free. I don't, I don't think people really understand how significant that is, especially when you are kind of the first in your family to do that. It's going to set a great example for generations to come. Uh, so sorry, I had to do a quick note on that. I'm very, very proud about that. Um, so we have, you know, we have job seekers on this, um, in this event, we have some people who are representing companies and are in HR. We also have some Indians too, but um, I'd love to, to, for us to start thinking about, thinking about for both job seekers and companies, kind of what we can do in this space, in this time. Um, you know, right now I, I mentioned that this is a time of kind of anxiety and people don't know what's going to happen. You know, there's, there's fear. Uh, a lot of people are kind of self-reflecting on what's important to them about a job. Um, unemployment rates are astronomical. And so really helping job seekers, we're going to start with job seekers, understand what they can do right now. Um, redundancies are expected to rise significantly in the coming months. So for those people that are affected, what are some practical tips uh, that can help people find a job? Carmen, let's start with you. Uh, absolutely, yes. It's, it's been such an unprecedented time. Um, and, and indeed, this is something that we think about and talk about quite a bit. And there's lots of data and, and benchmarks that we have that are no longer relevant in some ways. Like we, are, we have really had to rethink also how we um, partner with organizations and companies and how we are helping job seekers. Um, so first of all, leverage Indeed. Uh, we have resources for you. Um, we have a COVID-19 resource hub. Um, you can put a hashtag on your profile, ready to work. 
letting organizations know that you are ready to work now. Um, there's also a remote work filter so that if you are looking to work, uh, looking for work as well, you can identify those jobs that you can do from home, that you can do remotely. And so those are just some new things that we've had to really, um, um, you know, enable to make sure that we were supporting job seekers. Uh, the other thing that I would say is really think about transferable skills. I think that's an important thing to, to think about as well. You know, we have, um, you know, a lot of retail jobs, right, that are no longer available. But a lot of the skills that you need for a retail job, you will potentially need in a warehouse. If you're willing to work in a warehouse, um, that's an option. If you've worked in customer service in one industry, you can absolutely apply that. If you have used to being in front of, of customers uh, in a restaurant, you can go to a cafe. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways you can think about how you can take those transferable skills and make them translate into those industries and for those roles uh, that companies actually are hiring for right now. It's also probably not a bad time to think about what your long-term plan is uh, because your long-term plan might include a short-term option um, and that's okay. Um, if you want to think about what you're gonna be doing for the next three months, next six months, um, but also start planning for what the next two years are going to be. I think this is a really good opportunity to do that. Uh, so go to Indeed, leverage our COVID-19 resource hubs. There are so many resources we have there in terms of virtual interviewing. Um, you know, everyone is trying to figure that out as well. You know, thinking about how you can make yourself appear to organizations that are looking for folks right now and how you can find jobs that you can do right from home. So those are, you know, some really, I think, practical, simple things that you can do right now. Yeah, thank you for that, Carmen. And you mentioned kind of long-term planning um, and kind of, I think self-reflection is a part of that planning, right? Understanding what you want to do, but also how you think you're showing up to companies. This is a great time to rebrand um, and really kind of take a look at your resume and the story that you're telling. Recruiters spend an average of six seconds looking at a resume. There's some really cool or creepy research, however you look at it, that kind of shows the heat map of where recruiters' eyes go on a resume to determine, do we go, do we swipe left, do we swipe right, right? Is it, is it what we're looking for? So this is a great time to make yourself stand out. This is a great time to do what you just mentioned, which is make your long-term plan and decide that may mean some short stops along the way. Um, so I think this is all great advice, but, it, it, you know, starting with kind of self-reflection and making a plan and then determining, you know, how you need to look to employers going forward. Um, Ken, I, I'd love for you to weigh in as well as we think about at different stages of the application process, how can we stand out? Oh, wow. So uh, you, you can leverage, you can start to look at so I think a really good way to do it is to um, explore existing relationships that you have. So um, I find that now more than ever is a good time to start to look into the relationships you have as opportunities for how you can uh, get by in this time in terms of from a redundancy perspective, i.e. moving on from job loss uh, towards uh, perhaps finding something else. Uh, I also think doing exploring new relationships is a good idea so i remember when i was looking for work for example uh i signed up to things such as linkedin pro i think they still do that and i was able to kind of reach out to people who were in the same industry uh and maybe offer offer to maybe buy them a coffee or whatever but also to you know as a way to kind of pick their brains but whilst also you know reaching out to them to see whether there were potential uh, opportunities within their organizations that might be suitable to me, for example. And in the worst case scenario, I would end up uh, building a relationship out of doing that. So doing slightly unusual things like that are uh, quite useful. I also think tactical volunteering uh, is a suggestion. So, you know, if all things fail, uh, consider volunteering somewhere, you know, because uh, permanent opportunities could come out of doing that. And the beauty of volunteering is that you, you genuinely get the opportunity to build a relationship and have a real impact in that, in that environment. And people notice these things. People want people who 
have a real heart for what they're doing. And, and if, they're, if they're able to spot that in you, uh, it, they might create an opportunity that might not even have existed in the, in the first place at all. Thank you so much for that. Carmen, anything else to add? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, um, you know, I'm gonna go back to the, to the personal branding and the self-reflection piece. Mm -hmm. It is really important to know what your values are and to align your values with the companies. And I think it's really important to be honest about what your values are. You know, I think sometimes we have this idealized version of ourselves that might not be real. Um, and in these situations, I think it's really important that you really be honest with yourself about what your values are, what's important to you, and identify companies that are going to um, help you to achieve that, align with that in some way. And in doing so, I think you can lean in to what really makes you authentic to yourself and genuine, what's unique about you. Um, I feel like I spent a, a, a significant portion of you know, my career right out of college uh, listening to feedback, which is very important. We want to get better. But sometimes you can forget about the things that are uniquely you and spend so much time thinking about, I need to do this better, this better, this better, and not honing the things that are already strengths for you. And I think it's really important that you do lean into those things because it's going to make it, you stand out because it's going to be a reflection of who you really are. And I think that's really important. Too often we try to mold ourselves into um, a facsimile of who we think this company wants us to be. And we lose what's interesting and unique about ourselves. And I think that's also something that's really important. Fantastic. Absolutely. And imposter syndrome kind of weaves its way into that sometimes where you start to think you're not as great as what a company is looking for when actually you're amazing. You're amazing. You're super smart. You have the skills needed. So that Spot on, Carmen, that was spot on. Um, we also talk about, I, I mentioned earlier that we have you know, job seekers, but we also have employers uh, that are part of this event. And I can't tell you how many times I get um, you know, an email or an inquiry about what, what do we do, LaFon? What should we do right now? Especially in the moment that we have around kind of um, anti-racism work and you know, beyond just kind of COVID-19, but moving into the space of kind of social equity. And there's some tips that I definitely have for employers. Um, and then I would love for, for Carmen and Ken for you to both weigh in here. Um, so, so just kind of some really quick tips for those of you who are representing companies in this event. Um, don't, don't ignore what's happening, right? You can't stick your head in the sand and think that just because it's happening outside of the walls of your company that it, it's not something that you need to talk about. It is something that you need to address. Um, understand what your black employees are experiencing. A lot of black employees are in pain across the world. This is not specific to the US. This is a global movement and it is everybody against racism. So understand that and understand how your black employees are feeling. Focus on long-term systemic change. And I can't say that enough, so I'm going to repeat it. Focus on long-term systemic change. A lot of what's happening right now could be viewed as performative. I'm gonna put a statement out here, we're gonna change a logo there, uh, we may donate one time to an organization, but what are you doing within your company to dismantle the systems that have been put into place that actually are keeping people out? Are you removing bias from your systems? Are you removing barriers to entry? Take a look at your data related to hiring, to performance, to uh, promotion, all of those things. Take a look at that and make sure that you are removing bias and barriers. Educate yourself. This is a great time for self-reflection for everyone. It's a great time for self-reflection. Make sure that you're educating yourself. There's podcasts, there's books, there's articles, there's documentaries, there's all sorts of things where you can get an understanding of the historical content and the systemic content of anti-racism. Um, you can hold company-wide town halls and give everybody a voice and a space here. Uh, to not only talk about how they feel, but to heal. Um, you know, making experts available for discussions is really important. Having psychologists and psychiatrists really dive in because what we know is that when employees experience racism or any isms and phobias, 
uh, product, uh, productivity goes down, their sense of belonging goes down, morale, their uh, ability to have more capacity, all of that goes down. So helping people along the way is actually going to shore up your greatest assets, which are your employees. Um, don't expect black employees to educate others, right? Everybody's here to help, but they are not to help. And so keep that in mind. Uh, and then lastly, you know, making a personal and public commitment to be part of the solution, um, both today and tomorrow. Again, focusing on that long-term systemic change. So Carmen, amid the Black Lives Matter movement, how can we, how can job seekers identify anti-racist companies and learn more about the culture of a company before and while applying? Um, there's, um, I could probably do an hour on this. <laughs> um, it's, um, and it's, you know, really important. I mean, even at the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking to companies about employer brand and how important what they were doing and how they were treating their employees would be not just in the short term for their employees, but long term for their employer brand. You know, people were really going to pay attention to that. And I think that's only gotten exponentially more the case um, with, with George Floyd and the racial uh, uprising uh, that we've seen, you know, around the world. Um, we actually have been doing a lot of work in the space of workplace well-being and happiness. And we have, you know, identified a few things that are really important, you know, that, that people tend to feel are really important when it comes to, um, to being happy at work. And uh, LaFon, you'll be happy to know that the top one, certainly in a crisis, is belonging. Um, it's belonging. And the second is trust. And I think it's really important that people feel those things when they come in. And there, and there are a few ways that you can, can, can do it. Um, in the exploration phase, that's very important, right? So you're going to be doing research. You're going to be reaching out to, to people that work at that organization. You can look at Indeed's company pages and really understand how the people that work there talk about the organization, um, what, you know, how they rate on a variety of different dimensions, right? So you can, you can certainly do those kinds of things. I think it's going back to how you, uh, you know, what your values are and thinking about is this company's values aligned with my values um, in reading and learning about the company, is this a place that you would be passionate to work for, where you think you would enjoy doing your job? Um, I think as you start to apply for an organization, you can start to, um, you know, are they responding to you in a prompt fashion? You know, I think that's an indication of, you know, are they treating you like a person? Are they interested in you and your story, not just as a candidate? Um, when you are interviewing and you go in and you're having conversations with people, are these meaningful interactions? Do people seem genuine and authentic? Um, you know, are you again, you know, feeling like you're being treated like a person with a story and not just a resume and a profile? And there are questions that you can ask throughout the process, you know, questions you know, whether it's the hiring manager or people that work there or others in leadership, understanding how transparent they are about the company's performance uh, and metrics. How are they thinking about uh, performance and feedback? Um, do people feel like they trust their peers? Do they have social interactions with their peers? I mean, there's a, a litany of questions I think you can, you can ask to start to get at you know, those things that I think are really the things that people are trying to look at when they're trying to identify companies that are going to hold dear the things that are important to you, uh, things around belonging is, um, are they, you know, really sort of focused on, you know, diversity, but also inclusion, and most importantly, belonging. I've worked at organizations where everyone looks very similar to me, and so there's a lot of diversity. Doesn't always mean there's a sense of belonging. Um, so I think it's important that you take all of those different things into consideration and and ask those questions. Um, you know, of the of the hiring manager, of the recruiter, um, start to get a sense for, you know, how transparent they are, 
how willing they are to recognize the things that they have done, but the things that they need to do, because we know that no organization is doing it perfectly. Um, you know, those are things that I would, I would think about. And also when you walk into a place, you know, my, my mom would always say, you know, when she met someone, if she didn't like them, she would say, my spirit doesn't take to them. I think we have that same feeling about places. Like when you walk into a place, when you're having conversations, like, do you feel comfortable? You know, these are things that I think are meaningful. Um, and sometimes we might yeah, overlook. You better drop knowledge from mama. My mother would say the exact same thing. <laughs> My spirit doesn't really. Um, <laughs> Ken, very I nice would love to. So say that again, Carmen. It's a very nice way of making a non-database claim. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By saying this doesn't really feel good in my spirit. Um, <laughs> Ken, I want to ask you one last question and then we're going to move into uh, Q&A. So for those of you who haven't put your questions in, go for it. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so Ken, really quickly on your blog, you share some great side hustle ideas and you've already mentioned kind of doing things where your money can work for you while you sleep. Can you share some of those ideas with us and why you believe in them? So fantastic idea. So we, we are living through what I refer to as a side hustle uh, generation. And even more so in this time now, more of us are looking online. So the ideas I'm going to share are digital ideas that have got me in, in many ways to where I am today. So at the very core of what I see as some of the skill sets people need for the future is learning a set of digital skills that they can apply in different ways. So the ideas I'm going to share are low-cost ideas based around content. Uh, they, are, they rely on you being radically authentic uh, in being able to create an audience. They can lead you towards building a brand potentially and potentially a business even out of it. They give you authority over time and help you to create influence. And of course, they help you generate some income, some of which is passive and some of which is active. And um, what I love the most about them is that they give you location independence, just as I'm here at home. I can be anywhere I am. I could be where you are, LaForm, or where Carmen is, for example, and still operate. Now, the ideas I'm talking about here are, first is uh, creating an impactful blog. So the humblepenny.com is an example of an impactful blog built around a, an overarching theme, which is that we're helping uh, families and professionals achieve a life of financial independence. That creates a connection between us and an audience. And that connection starts to build what's known as the know, like, and trust. And the more you build that know, like, and trust, you build essentially a tribe. And that tribe over time essentially feeds you through you solving their problems through products and services. It could be digital courses. It could be all kinds of things where you're essentially solving a problem for what will become your ideal customer an avatar in the world of your audience. It's the first idea is blogging. And out of that blogging you can generate all kinds of income, whether it's sponsorships, affiliate income, ads, courses, and so on. There are lots of different revenue streams you can explore by doing that. Second is YouTubing. I started uh, running a YouTube channel last summer uh, at The Humble Penny. You can look it up if you want. Uh, and it's been the most fun thing ever that I've started because first of all, I've, I've grown up being extremely shy of being in front of the camera. So a lot of my journey has been about pushing myself outside my comfort zone. Even this event, for example, is pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. So YouTubing is a great way for you to um, expose yourself to a totally different world. And the beauty of YouTube is that the YouTube algorithm goes, goes completely nuts and does the job of promoting your content for you, provided you've provided quality, value, authenticity, and you've done it consistently over a period of time. And of course, through that platform, very similar to blogging, you can generate all kinds of incomes, whether they are ads or sponsorships. So we get approached, for example, by pretty large brands to work with us as partners on our YouTube channel. So that's number two. And the third and final one is my favorite, which is membership sites, okay? So this is where out of your radical authenticity over time, you build a tribe. And that tribe love your life philosophy and they love your dreams and your approach to life and they want to congregate around you and you help, you're helping them essentially set off on a journey. The beauty of memberships is that it provides you with recurring revenues 
and it's sticky revenues, and it's a form of crowdfunding in a way. So as examples, if you've got a membership site that charges, say, £30 a month, and you've got 300 members, you'd be making £9,000 per month. If you've got 1,000 members, you'd be making £30,000 per month. And these are ideas that anybody, actually anybody can run from their home, from their computer, but built around the beauty of content. Can notice with these three ideas I've mentioned, really what you're doing is using free content and premium content and playing around with how they're structured, built around storytelling and built around this idea of radical authenticity, okay? So yeah, those have been my ideas. There's a, there's a ton more that, you know, you can, you can always check out our, our blog or the YouTube channel for some more ideas. Thank you, Ken. I am just, I'm taking notes over here. I've, <laughs> I've got some Carmen, listen to your intuition and your spirit. And you're talking about, honestly, creationism versus consumerism. And if we focus on being creators, we will create generational wealth and money that works for us. I'm, I'm writing all this stuff down. I'm about to do a blog. Okay, <laughs> let's go to Q&A and we will try to answer as many of these as we can. We have people from everywhere, people from Indeed, but people from job seekers and companies that are external. So I'm just gonna use first names and I apologize in advance if I say them incorrectly. We're gonna start with Alexis. And the question here is, how can I deal with microaggressions in a professional manner? Who can I go to? How can I maintain a professional relationship while doing this? Carmen, Ken, either of you can jump in if you'd like. Um, you know, LaFawn, you're, the, you're probably the expert here. I mean, I, I, I hope you're leveraging your, your HR um, sort of counterparts really to help you navigate this, because I think it's very important to, for it to be addressed, but I think it's important for it to be recognized by the organization as well. Um, so, you know, I would really encourage you, if at all possible, to make sure that, you know, you don't feel like you have to do this on your own and that you feel like you have partners who can, who can help you uh, really navigate this. Yeah, ag agreed. Microaggressions, uh, in my experience, uh, it starts with education because um, I've definitely seen some organizations who don't recognize microaggressions for what they are. You can call them micro, you can call them macro, but either way, it's aggression. Um, and, and so sometimes it's necessary for the organization itself to be educated. Your HR org should absolutely know uh, when things are microaggressions or not. They should be willing to coach the employee that you had the issue with. It is not up to you to educate anyone as a marginalized person, but you can, if you feel like you have a relationship with your colleague, maybe they didn't understand what they said, um, and you want to engage, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, but you should be able to have someone within the HR organization who recognizes what microaggressions are, and language thereof should be a part of the code of conduct for the company as well. Um, so there are a few different avenues, but I would start with your HR professional, make sure that they understand uh, what you went through and then uh, engage them accordingly as that that employee or that manager should have some coaching along the way. Uh, we'll go to the next one, which is uh, Jossie. This says, this is more for Ken. A lot of um, Black Indigenous people of color live in expensive cities around the world. So a lot of our income goes towards housing, rent, etc. Uh, what recommendations can you make to help continue to save for our futures when housing takes up a lot of our money? Okay, so this is, a, this is a, a classic question. So I live just on the outskirts of London, but for a lot of my corporate life, I worked right in the heart of London, okay? But we chose to live on the outskirts of London deliberately because we could mm -hmm. buy a house that was a lot cheaper and we could therefore then create a plan around paying off that house over time. So um, I would say that a, a lot of us need to really reassess the need for us to live in expensive cities. Um, and I know, you know this, is, this is an unpopular you know, point to make, but it's a necessary point because uh, what essentially happens is, is that the number one thing that stops most, most people building any wealth is that they spend too much money on too much debt that they took on they took on to buy a property potentially. 
Okay, so when I talk about this idea of life design, we have to ask ourselves very hard questions, which is, this city I'm living in, do I really have to live in this city to do life the way I really want to do it? It's a difficult question, but it's a necessary question, because if you really want to radically live differently to most people, because, you know, everybody else, if everybody else is getting the same results and everybody else is frustrated, then it means something is wrong in the way everybody else is looking at life. So you have to think very differently and think, well, actually, how else could I do this life such that I get a slightly different result? So in my case, I moved out of the expensive city and moved out a few miles out, and then I'd commute, but my property was a lot cheaper, which meant that I could get rid of it and build my net worth a lot quicker. Right? That was a radically different result on popular, but it was what was necessary for me to get a different result. Mm. Thank I you, like Ken. Him. I feel like he's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know where I, Carmen is, and I know where I am, and uh, I have to think about some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take the next question from Grant, which is How do I cope at work? when a senior member of the team is covertly racist and my manager is brushing my concerns aside. I have twice reached out for an answer from my manager and received nothing back. I've also looked through my emails and they are appearing as sent to no receiver. Thank you. Huh, okay. So I can't, I can't really address the email portion of that, um, but I think we can probably all weigh in on the, uh, when you have a senior member of the team that is covertly racist, uh, manager is kind of brushing it off. Um, there's a, if I was a part of this organization, there's a lot more that I could do. If you have somebody who's in a role like mine with diversity, inclusion and belonging, or you have a strong HR organization, there is a lot that you can do there. Cause again, it's not up to you to make those changes. However, if you do not have those things in place, I would go back to the advice that Carmen gave and think about whether or not this is an environment in which you can thrive, right? You may not be able to make changes and if this is an organization that does not value diversity in the way that it protects its employees, get out. I will never tell anybody to stay in a toxic environment. Do what you can, use your voice, and if things don't change and things are happening to you, leave. And I know that's really hard advice right now because unemployment is so high and so you may feel like you're stuck, but don't stay in a space that is going to degrade you, your life, your uh, mental ability, your emotional ability, any of that stuff, if they're not taking the responsibility to make those changes. So I'll stop there before I get on my soapbox. <laughs> Carmen, Ken, did you wanna add into that at all? No, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely spot on. Because the thing we've got to remember is that you've got to always remember that your employer is not doing you, is not doing you a favor by giving you a job. I.e., you are in the job because you bring particular skill sets. You bring a personality. You bring something to, to the table. Otherwise, they wouldn't be paying you in the first place. And every employer, I'm going to tell you now, right? Most employers actually underpay their employees. So if anything taking the leap and actually going somewhere else will probably lead to you finding better opportunities and potentially even better paid opportunities. So not mm -hmm. only do you actually find the culture in an organization that actually accepts someone like you and is more welcoming, but you actually end up with a, potentially a slightly better result as well. So I would agree with what the board said. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we have a question, and I think this might have to be our last question. Um, though I don't want to leave. I mean, I got started with a DJ, and now I don't want to have a day without starting off with a DJ. Um, but this question, uh, Ken, is for you. And that is uh, from Renee. It says, hi, Ken. Amazing story and big respect. Um, how can the Black community and allies assure that the black pound slash dollar slash euro slash enter any other um, money there stays within the black community longer. Okay, look, it's, I think it's pretty simple. We, we have to be more intentional. And I know this is gonna sound really weird, but we have to be more intentional about spending within the black community. 
That's really what has to happen. We have to be more intentional. So say, for example, every week I spend money on things. I might buy on Amazon. I might buy somewhere else. I think we just have to be prepared to say to ourselves, well, actually, where are those businesses, that one man or one woman business that we are not really supporting? Yeah. Because if you can start to have more visibility on those types of businesses, what they do, where they are, and you are more intentional about spending your money, your hard-earned money with those, with those organizations, you will find that the money actually stays more, you know, which is, which is the truth. I used to work for an organization run, you know, just for, for an example, run by, uh, you know, a Jewish guy. And he said to me one time, oh, as a CFO at the time, he said to me, oh, we're going to move on and move our auditors and our accountants onto another organization. And I found out later that this was actually his brother-in-law who was running another business. And in fact, what he was doing was keeping the business within his community, right? Which, you know, in a way makes sense. But, you know, but that's because perhaps they've built a, a culture where they support each other. So in my view, I think there has to be that culture of, of wanting um, collective success rather than almost a scarcity mindset of, I just want myself to be successful. I think the more we want this community or collective success, the more we will be more intentional about how we use our money and where we spend our money. So I hope that's giving you a bit of an answer to that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you both, Ken and Carmen. This was a fantastic conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for about two, three, four, 12 more hours on all of these topics. Um, really appreciate your, your brilliance, your life experience, and your professional experience. Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today. I'm going to bring Lillian back up so that we can close out our event. Thank you, LaFawn, and thank you to all the speakers who shared their amazing stories, powerful tips, practical steps that I most definitely will be taking on board myself. Um, and thank you to everyone that made this event happen, all the members of the Black Inclusion Group, Shay, Alassane, Bradley, Andrea, talking about Jill, Lewis, Sorry if I forgot anyone. And of course, Francis, our amazing regional co-chair for EMEA. And on a final note, now is a good time to really reevaluate what's important to us all and ask the companies you work for those hard questions and find those places that you can really truly be your authentic self. And of course, Indeed is here to help through those difficult times. And despite a downturn, there is always going to be progression. So thank you all for tuning in.